Hello everyone, I'm James Ennis for Tone Bass, and today we're going to talk about practice. Now, since you're watching, I know that you probably do practice and probably value the importance of practice, so that of course gets one big topic of conversation out of the way. The fact is, as we know, you cannot get better without practice. But can we practice more efficiently? Can we practice more effectively? And over the years, I've certainly thought a lot about this and developed a few thoughts and theories, so I'd like to share those with you today. First of all, the most important thing, I think, when playing the violin in general, and certainly during practicing, is listen. Listen to yourself play. Uh, we get really caught up in how we do things and what we do, but sometimes we don't always listen to really what the effect is. And this might seem like the most basic thing in the world. And it is the most basic thing in the world. But if it feels right, but sounds bad, then it's wrong. <laughs> and we really have to develop our ability to be objective listeners. There are things that seem like it should all work, but it just doesn't sound right. And you need to trust your ears and not trust the feeling in your hands or trust somehow the mental idea that what you're doing is correct because really it is about what it sounds like and so listening is absolutely key and that ties into I think my other very big point which is it's not about time it's about focus it's about concentration now I have been as guilty as anyone I would think over the years of the sort of mindless sawing. I grew up in Canada in the 80s, sort of a golden age for NHL hockey. And I used to joke that my very most productive seasons of the year were the NHL playoffs because I would just sit in front of the TV and just scratch away for hours. And, you know, building a certain amount of uh, strength and stamina, yes, that is an important thing that does take time. You know, you cannot expect to be able to play a 50 minute Elgar violin concerto if you never play for more than an hour a day. That's just never going to happen. But I think like many people that there's a lot more to life than sitting in a room and practicing. And I was really concerned as a young person about uh, missing out on certain things in life because most of my friends, pretty much all, all of my school friends, uh, didn't play music so they wanted to do other things and I wanted to do those other things with them so I thought a lot in those early days and had the guidance of, of wonderful teachers including my father who was really my greatest musical influence on how to work efficiently so that if you're practicing for two hours you want to get two hours of work done you don't want to practice for two hours and get 30 minutes of work done if you're just looking to get 30 minutes of work done then practice for 30 minutes um, I think a lot of that is concentration. Now, as I mentioned before, there is a time for sawing away and building strength, building stamina. But there are two really dangerous factors when practicing just thinking about time. Uh, for one thing, it does not at all re uh, replicate the concert experience. If you are doing mindless practicing, how foreign is that to the experience of being in a concert hall when you are hyper concentrated, when you are hyper aware? Uh, I come across it all the time, you know, where students will say, I just don't understand it. You know, I was at a point with this piece where you could roll me out of bed at three in the morning and I could play it or I could play it while talking on the phone or I could play it while watching a game on TV. And that's all fine and good, but that is such an entirely different mindset than the concert hall when all of a sudden you're thinking about everything. And as difficult as it can be to do this, it's enormously helpful during your practice sessions to put yourself as best you can into the mindset of being in a concert hall. In a concert hall, you're always asking yourself questions. How does this work? How do I do this? What comes next? You know, and I always talk about how there's a difference between knowing something and knowing that you know it. And I think that's crucial. Knowing that you know it means you have the confidence to go up in a concert situation in front of your friends, your colleagues, in front of strangers and say, yes, I know how this works. I know how to do it and I know how I do it and I know why I do it. 
Um, the other big danger, I think, about mindless practice is that, you know, you think about the concept of practice, and I love the idea that, that practice in French is répétition, repetition. You were doing it over and over. Now, the idea is if you are practicing carefully, you figure out how to do something correctly, and then you repeat it to build that muscle memory, to build the well, really all the memory in your mind as well, of how to accomplish a certain thing correctly. Now, often what happens in mindless practice sessions is you play something and you play it poorly and you're vaguely aware maybe that you play it poorly. Maybe you're not aware at all, but you just keep doing it and you do it over and over. And we're all guilty of this at times. I know, I know we all are, um, <laughs> of playing something and saying to oneself, that sounds bad. Maybe if I do it again, it'll sound better. Often that is not a solution at all. All you end up doing is practicing your mistakes. You are repeating your bad habits. And every time you repeat those mistakes and those bad habits, they become more deeply ingrained. So if you spend this much time of worthless practice with some sort of a time goal in mind, like I'm going to practice for this many hours and this much is bad practice, it takes that much practice again just to get back to where you were, not even to start getting better. So it becomes exponentially more difficult to actually accomplish the goals that you're looking for. Now into some more specific ideas for practice. Now, one thing I want to talk about is warming up. And this is something that is very individual. And so I don't feel that I'm at all qualified to tell you how you need to warm up. But I do think that the really important thing that everyone needs to remember is to listen to your body's signals. Some people will begin a practice session and they're just so eager to get into it that they'll just launch right into maybe the most difficult technical stuff to play. And that is likely to be both demoralizing and potentially dangerous. There are certain things, and I think that as one gets older, you become more aware of this. There are certain muscles that take a while to warm up. You know, we have our larger muscles, but we have all these smaller twitch muscles. And there is a danger of hurting something. And if you feel, and this applies very much to the end of a practice session <laughs> as well as the beginning or the middle or any point, but if you are getting a bad signal from your body, if something feels wrong and something hurts, don't try to push through that. You know, at 15 extra minutes now is not going to make up for a month off later or more. Uh, injuries tend to be cumulative too. You want to avoid the first one. You want to avoid that first time that it hurts. Um, now, that being said, of course, building stamina requires pushing through certain types of limits, but there is a difference between being mentally exhausted and physically tired uh, than getting a warning signal from your body. And remember also that even though what we are doing, we tend to think of being specifically related to hands, wrists, arms, maybe shoulders, the body is incredibly interconnected and musicians that are digitally active often find tension in all sorts of unexpected places of the body. There is, of course, a huge mess in our shoulders that causes uh, nerves to have these cross relations. You often see it in violinists. You see it in the face. You see it in the jaw. You see it in the mouth. None of that is necessary. It is often very difficult to avoid, but it's worth trying. Uh, my theory is that it's hard enough to play the violin. Don't make it harder by adding tension to parts of the body where it doesn't need to be. Think about your hips, think about your knees, think about your feet. The number of violinists that curl and twist their feet when they're playing, I think, well, why are you doing that? Um, it's just a cross-relation of some nerves that are causing tension in an unnecessary place. I think often if the lower body is free, the upper body will be more free as well. So really take the time to consider, what am I doing with my legs? What am I doing with my hips? What's happening in my back? All of this is important. A more relaxed body going into to, to playing an instrument will allow more of the resources to go to the places where it really matters. So when you're warming up, you might want to consider starting off something a little bit slower and think about the sound. Just 
think about what sound you're creating, one thing that you can always do on the violin, always, is try to play more beautifully.